Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another day of Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Sarah. I'm one of the educators here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, and thank you for joining us this morning. We are doing one of our very special Ask a Scientist programs. Now, this might be the first time that you're tuning in for an Ask a Scientist program, and we're so happy that you're here, or maybe you've seen these ones before. The way these programs are structured is we are hoping that you're going to send in your questions because... I'm the scientist today. We're actually all scientists today. Anytime you join us in a program, you come to the aquarium, you read a book, you make observations, you become a scientist. But today I'm going to be the scientist that you can ask questions to. Now, our theme today or our topic is marine mammals. So while you're watching today, if you already have questions or if you have questions about what I'm talking about, about marine mammals, go ahead and send in those questions because we really want this program to be led by you, what you want to talk about. Now, I personally can talk about marine mammals for probably more than half an hour, but I want to know what marine mammals you want to talk about and what you want to know. So we have a number right here. Now I have my friend Soraya in the studio with me and she is controlling everything you see behind me and she's going to take your questions and you can text those questions into this number 562-286-1838. Now that's if you're watching this program live. Now if you're watching after the fact, so it's no longer Wednesday morning on September 28th at 9 a.m. If you're watching after the fact, you can still ask your questions because this isn't Ask a Scientist program, but we do ask that you email us at live at lbaop.org and we'll be able to respond to those emailed questions. Now, the way we're gonna do is I'm gonna just start talking about marine mammals. First, we're gonna talk about what makes a mammal a mammal. That's pretty important when we're talking about marine mammals. And then I'm going to start talking about some marine mammals that we maybe have here at the aquarium or we see here along our coast. But whenever you have questions, send them in. We'll keep that text line up. We'll put it up periodically. Send in those questions and we can talk about what it is that you want to talk about. All right. You ready to get started, scientists? All right. So I said we're going to make, talk about what makes a mammal a mammal, right? Because we're talking about marine mammals today. And there's two parts to that word, marine and mammals. So let's focus on mammals first. Now, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to look around the room wherever you are. Look around the room. You might be in a classroom, so you might have some classmates around. You might be at home with your family. You might be by yourself watching, which you can still look around. And I want you to think for a moment, are there any mammals in the room that you're in? Hmm. Now, I can look around the room I'm in, in our studio here at the aquarium, and I see two mammals. What about you? Do you notice any mammals in the room around you? Go ahead and point. Now we not we say that it's not nice to point, but I want you to go ahead and point to marine mammal. That's why you can point to yourself. I can also point to Soraya in the room where I am. So mammal, humans are mammals. We are mammals. Now there's a lot of other mammals out there, things like dogs and cats and cows and monkeys and polar bears. The list goes on. But I want you to think about those animals. Do we, humans, look like all those animals? Not really. So mammals come in all different shapes and sizes, but we share some characteristics. And that means there's some things that we actually have in common with all those animals. So you may never, not have thought that you had something in common with an animal like a polar bear, but we actually do have some things in common. Now, the way that I like to help myself remember what makes a mammal a mammal is I'm going over to my document camera and I'm going to write out a word. And that word happens to be whale which works out well because whales are also a mammal. It's also Wednesday, and here at the aquarium, we like to celebrate Whale Wednesday. So happy Whale Wednesday, everyone. So whale is sort of our helpful word here that's gonna let us uh, remember all the characteristics that make a mammal a mammal. So each letter is gonna stand for a word or one of those characteristics. So I want you to think, do you know what makes a mammal a mammal? We'll put that text line up again. And if you have an idea of one of those characteristics that makes a mammal a mammal, you can go ahead and text us in at 562-286-1838. Now, I'm going to start us off. I'm going to use the H right here because that is something that all mammals have. I certainly have a lot of it right here on top of my head. Go ahead and touch your head. You can even touch your arms. What do you have covering your head? We have it on our arms. We have it all over our body. Hair, that's right, we have hair. So one characteristic of being a mammal is having hair or fur. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna write hair. That is one characteristic that makes a mammal a mammal. Now you might be trying to think of there's any mammals that maybe don't have hair or some mammals, sounds weird to think of them having hair like a whale, but mammals 
they have hair or fur at, at least some point in their life. So while in some forms they may not have that hair or fur anymore, at some point in their life they do have hair. So whales, they have hair as a baby. They have these little uh, hairs that come from their rostrum or the front of their face, their nose. They come out of these bumps right here. These are called tubercles or hair follicles. And in each one of those little bumps is a little piece of hair. And their hair is used to tickle mom to let her know that the baby whale is ready for milk. So they do have hair, but then a lot, like a lot of human adults, they go bald eventually and they lose their hair. But at some point in their life, they have hair or fur. Excellent. So that's one characteristic. But let's go down the line. So W, that might be one of the most uh, sort of difficult ones to think about. But the W has to do with what is running through our bodies. Think about what circulates through your body. It keeps us alive. If you put your hand over your chest and you feel that bump, 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 your heart is circulating it. Your blood, that's right. So mammals are warm blooded, which means the temperature inside of our body remains pretty constant because our blood is warm and that helps regulate the temperature inside and it keeps us healthy and it keeps all of our organs working really well. So I'm gonna write warm blood. All right, so mammals are warm blooded. We have hair, hmm, the A. Now this has to do with something that we do every day, all day, without even thinking about it, but it's very important for our survival. The air, it's what we breathe. So we breathe air using our lungs. So mammals, whether they live in the water or on land, they have lungs that they're gonna pull in oxygen or air and help them breathe. So if we look at our dolphins here, even though they spend their entire lives in the water, if we look right here, this hole right here on top, that's their blowhole, and they'll come to the surface and they'll exhale and then they'll inhale again and dive back down. Now, some animals have different lung capacities, which means they can hold their breath for a lot longer than we can, like most marine mammals, but they're still using their lungs to breathe. So we breathe air. All right, we've got two more letters, and these both have to do with things when we're a baby. So think about, how are you born? Or how are other animals born? When we think about animals like lizards and reptiles and birds, they hatch out of an, that's right, they hatch out of an egg. Did we hatch out of an egg? No, your mom didn't sit on an egg for nine months. And for some mammals, like a blue whale, which is 100 feet long, if they laid an egg, it'd be the size of a minivan, and they'd have to sit on a minivan-sized egg for about a year at the bottom of the ocean. And not only does that sound ridiculous, but we just talked that they breathe air, and so they'd have to leave their egg to go breathe, and that would be unsafe for the egg. So mammals, we don't lay eggs. We give what's called live birth. You're born alive. You're not hatched from an egg. So live birth. Now, in science, as scientists, we n almost never say always or never. We say almost never or most of the time or most of the animals because we know in science there's always something that's going to surprise us. There's always exceptions. And there's exceptions to this live birth rule. So while most mammals give live birth, there are two mammals who fill all these other characteristics, but they do lay eggs. And that is an animal called a platypus and an animal called an echidna. So they're mammals, but they lay eggs. All right, we've got one more characteristic. Now I said this one also has to do with when you're a baby. And I want you to think about what you ate as a baby. Did your mom stuff little cheeseburgers down your throat? Well, I hope not, because not only can we not chew because we don't have teeth, but it's not very good for us when we're first born. So you probably ate or drank milk. And that's the last characteristic of a mammal is their mothers feed their young milk. Now, for us humans, we drink milk, right? We put it in a cup, we drink it. But for a lot of mammals, like especially marine mammals, things like whales, the milk that they're feeding their young is really thick. It's kind of like the consistency of pudding. And so instead of drinking it, it's more like they're eating it. So we use the E as eats milk. Or we could say eats or drinks milk. So these are the five characteristics of what make a mammal a mammal. So they are warm, blooded, we have hair, we breathe air, we give live birth, and we eat or drink milk. And so those are the characteristics that sort of unify this group of animals. So 
whatever kind of mammal we're looking at, we have those things in common. Even though our bodies might look different, the type of fur we have, sort of what other foods we eat, the way we move around, the way we explore might be different, but these characteristics are going to be similar. Now, we're going to be talking about marine mammals specifically, and that kind of separates into a smaller group. Now, we would be considered a terrestrial mammal, and that word terrestrial, it means land, so we live on the land, right? But marine, it means in the ocean. Now, you might be thinking, well, I went to the beach last weekend because it's been so hot here in Southern California. Does that mean I'm a marine mammal? It does not. We do like to go in the water. We can go to the beach. We can play around. But a marine mammal's life depends on being in or near the water. So think about an animal like a seal or sea lion, which are the first two marine mammals we're going to talk about, which I'm going to have Soraya bring up a picture. Their livelihood depends on the ocean. Now, if we get really big picture, all of our lives depend on the ocean for oxygen, for food, and other things. But these animals, they need the, to be in or super near the ocean in order to survive. Because if we think about where their home is, how they move most easy, and where their food source is, it all goes back to the ocean. So our list of marine mammals include things like seals and sea lions, walruses, dolphins, whales, sea otters, and then one of what that might surprise people is a polar bear. Now you might be thinking, well, bears live on land, and when I see polar bears, they're walking along the snow or land, but just like the seals and sea lions, their livelihood depends on the ocean, their food source, sort of their protection, is all from the ocean, polar bears, their lives also depend on being right near the water, being in or getting their food from the water. So they are considered a marine mammal as well. All right, now we've got two marine mammals up here. These are two different ones, even though they look very similar and they're found in very similar places. They're even found in the same exhibit here at the aquarium. We have a sea lion right here and a seal all the way over there. Now I wanna pause for a moment and let's make some observations and see what do we notice about these two animals? Are there things that look the same? Are there things that look different? How do we tell the difference between a seal and a sea lion? If you're at the aquarium or if you've been out on a boat and you see this animal and you're like, I can't figure out, am I looking at a seal or a sea lion? Well, I'm gonna teach you scientists how us scientists can tell them apart. But let's take a moment and make some observations. We'll put that text line up again. We'll keep it up there for a while. So if you have any questions or you want to share the things that you know we use to tell them apart. Oh, look at these two sea lions right here. These are two sea lions here at the aquarium. This is going to be Parker. He is our big boy right here. And I can tell Parker because of this bump on his head. He's the only one who has this bump on his head. Now, he didn't run into a wall in his exhibit. That is part of his body. It's a tangle of muscles that connect to his jaw. And that tells us that he is our dominant male. So we have four sea lions, they're all male, but he is the dominant, he's sort of the leader of the pack. And we can tell that because of this tangle of muscles called a sagittal crest. The name is not very important, we just know that if you've got that big bump on your head, you're the leader. And then the one next to him is most likely Harpo because they are best buds. But what do you notice about these sea lions? What about if we put up a picture of a seal? What do you notice about seals? Now I tell you there are four things that we uh, look for to tell if we're uh, looking at a seal or a sea lion. There are four different ways. You don't have to see all four because just one will tell you the difference. But there are four different things that we look at to see if we're looking at a seal or a sea lion. Now, the first thing you may have noticed when we're looking at this seal right here is the color pattern. Their fur, right? They're mammals, so they have fur. Their fur is sort of this, we call it mottled. And what that means, it's kind of like spotted and there's different splotches and patches of different colors. And so these harbor seals, this is a type of seal we have here at the aquarium and along our coast are called harbor seals. They have this sort of white and grayish, blackish pattern on their body. Now, here at the aquarium, when we're referring to the two, we like to compare them to ice cream because those are recognizable things. So if I was going to compare the seal's fur to ice cream, I would compare it to my favorite flavor, cookies and cream, or it could be chocolate chip too. But that's the difference is they've got this kind of two-tone fur color or pattern. But then if we look at a sea lion, which is going to be a California sea lion here at the aquarium, look at this sea lion. So our sea lions actually are artists and they can paint. But you can see the color of their body is a solid brown, like a chocolate color. So that's one difference. If you're on a boat or walking along a beach or a pier and you see an animal and you're like, seal or sea lion, seal or sea lion, seal or sea lion. One thing you can do if you can see their whole body is look at their fur color. And if it's solid brown, sea lion. If it's that kind of spotty pattern right here, seal. 
So that's one way to tell the difference. What's another way? Now this picture highlights it really well, but you may not even know what you're looking for. So I'm gonna have you look just behind the eyes of both of these two animals, and what do you notice? Does it look the same behind their eye or is it different? That's right, it's different. So both of these animals, they do have ears. They can both hear. But what we notice is our sea lion right here has this cute little ear flap right there. Now, if you reach up and touch your head, you have ear flap. So you might think that this is your ear, but your ear is actually on the inside. This is your outer ear, and it helps kind of funnel the sound into your ear. So sea lions have an external ear flap, an ear flap on the outside. Now, if you look over here on the seal, do you see an ear flap? No, it's just sort of like a hole. So they have an ear on the inside, but they don't have that external ear flap. So maybe you're on a boat and you're out at the water or you see an animal kind of bobbing up and down in the water and you know it's a seal or a sea lion, but you can't see the fur color, but you can look at the head and see, oh, ear flap or no ear flap, sea lion or seal. So that's another way to tell the difference is looking at the, for an ear flap or for a lack of ear flap. So that's the second thing. A third thing, is we'll have Soraya, in just a moment, I see some questions getting in, coming in. We'll have her put up a picture of a full body of a sea lion and a full body of a seal. We'll go back and forth, and I want you to look at their body shape. All right, so the question that we just got is, can they get water in their ears? Oh, that is a great question. You know what? I don't know that I've ever asked that question before. So that's amazing that you just texted that in. Now, I'm going to give you what my thoughts are on this, and I might have Soraya try and look it up and see if she can kind of confer what I'm saying or confirm or give us more information. But my thought would be that they probably don't get water in their ears the same way that we do. Because if you think about it, when we go in the water and we get water in our ears, is it comfortable? No, we're like out of the water and we're like shaking and like pounding on our head to get that water out. And sometimes you get something called swimmer ear if you're in the water for so long and the water just sits in there and you might have to put drops or medicine in. So for an animal who spends their life in the water, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for them to get water in their ears and it be hazardous. So they might get water in and it might not be a problem. But my thought is just maybe the way the shape of their ear is, or there's like a little flap maybe that kind of covers when they go in so they don't get water in. And Sarai's giving me a thumbs up. So that is the that is true. So they don't get water in their ears the same way that we do. But that's an excellent question. That make, made me, your scientist today, think a little bit harder. Excellent. Keep those questions coming. All right. So... I said to, we're going to look at the body. So this is a great picture to see. Our sea lions not only have a longer body and they're larger, but look at their flippers down here. So I want everyone to take their arms and put them out straight or up in the air, out to the side, as long as you're not bumping into anyone around you. But put your arms up straight. These are your sea lion flippers. So sea lions, they swim with their flippers and their front flippers are really long. You can see it right here. Really long flippers. Now, when they move through the water, they kind of push them like this. So you can swim like a sea lion as long as you're not bumping into anyone or anything. So they swim like this and propel themselves through the water. And then when they're on land, you can see they almost bend their flippers. And it's kind of like they walk on all fours, sort of like a dog or a cat. You can see it right here. So sea lions have those long flippers. Now, let's take a look at a seal. Look at this little flipper right here. A little chicken wing. So seals... They don't have those long flippers. Give me little chicken wings. They've got their little chicken wings. And when they're swimming in the water, these little wings, their flippers, are used more kind of for steering, and they're actually gonna use their tail for swimming. Their tail kind of fans out like this, and they can kind of move it like this, sort of. And so that's how they're gonna push themselves through the water, and then they're gonna steer more with their flippers, their front flippers. And then when they're on land, they can't, this one you can reach, but sometimes their flippers are so short and they've got such a round belly, which is a good thing for a seal. Their flippers can't reach the ground. And so the way they move, instead of walking almost on all fours like the sea lion, is they bounce on their belly. It's a very cool thing called galumphing. And you may have never heard that word before, but let's say it all together because it's a very fun word, galumphing. And what that means is imagine you're lying on your belly and you're just bouncing like this along on your belly. And that's how they move. They go lump. It's about as graceful as it sounds. But that is the third way you can tell the difference is their flipper. So maybe you see an animal, sometimes they haul out, which means they come out of the water on a dock or on the beach. And you can see their flippers are different. Short flippers and the bouncing on their belly. Seal. Oh, look at this little seal. 
This is Kaya. She is a pup that we have here, although she's not quite a pup anymore. I think she's about four and a half. Uh, but you can see those very short front flippers. And then a sea lion would have those long flippers. Now the last difference, we can't really show you because I don't think we have a video of it. It has to do with the vocalization or the noise that they make from their mouth. Now, if you're in class, check with your teacher first if you have permission, but I want you to give your best sea lion impression. Are you ready? Go. Those were excellent. You're right, they kind of go ar, ar, ar. They don't really clap like that, but they made that barking or that roar noise. And that's how we know it's a sea lion, it's how they get their name, is they're very loud and they're very vocal. And if you come visit us, ours are very vocal, especially Harpo right here. He's got a very melodious voice. So they are very vocal. Now a seal, on the other hand, they might go or blow a little raspberry like that. But other than that, they don't make much noise. So if you know that you're near seals or sea lions and you hear that barking noise, but you can't see the animal, you're gonna know always it's gonna be a sea lion. So that's how you can tell if you're near a sea lion is you'll hear the noise. So those are the four th ways that we can tell the difference between seals and sea lions. And these are a pretty common marine mammal for us to see here right along our coast on beaches, on the dock. Sometimes if you're on a boat and you go by a buoy, which are those kind of floating metal structures that tell boats which directions to go. Sea lions like to haul out or come up onto rocks, just like you see them on rocks here. So these are the sea lions here at the aquarium in our exhibit. And our husbandry staff, our staff who work with the animals, they are doing a training session where they're checking the body, they're feeding, they're making sure our animals are all healthy. This is Harpo right here. He is our longest sea lion. He's also so very skilled. Excellent. All right, so we have about 10 minutes left or so, maybe eight minutes, and we're gonna switch gears to talk about another marine mammal, which happens to be my favorite marine mammals. And I did wish everyone a happy Whale Wednesday, so we need to talk about whales. So seals and sea lions are one type of marine mammal, but here is a very different looking marine mammal. Now, one of the biggest differences between a whale and seals or sea lions is seals and sea lions, they can come up out of the water and spend time out of the water, right? We, they spend time on the beach, on rocks, on buoys, on docks, uh, and that's when they're just resting. So they do spend most of their time in the water swimming and eating, but they will rest out of the water. Now whales, they're a little bit different. They do spend their entire life in the water. They may jump out of the water for a couple seconds, but that's just to go back down into the water. Now, what do you notice about this whale? Remember, you can text us at 562-286-1838. Now, this is a humpback whale, but you can ask questions about any type of whale that you can think of because there are lots and lots of different types of whales out there. And there's even two categories of whales. So this whale right here, this humpback, is called a baleen whale. And I'll tell you what, I'll explain baleen in a moment, but the other group of whales are called toothed whales. So if I say baleen and toothed whales, what do you think baleen might be referring to? If one group are called toothed whales, has to do with what's in their mouth, then maybe baleen also has to do with what's in their mouth. And that's right. So these whales, like a humpback, are our baleen whales. They're what we call filter feeders. So here is the open mouth of a humpback whale. And this stuff right here, that almost kind of looks like hair stacked together or kind of furry, this is baleen. Now baleen is made of keratin, which is the same thing our fingernails are made of. Uh, and it is a, a feeding structure. So it allows our humpback whales to feed or baleen whales in general to feed. And the way it works, it's kind of like a pasta strainer. So think about if you have ever helped mom or dad or an adult make pasta, or maybe you've made it on your own. Once you boil all the pasta in the water, you need to get the water and pasta separate, right? So you put it into a thing that's got some holes in it and it catches all the pasta, but it lets all the water go. That's kind of how baleen works. So what this whale does, or a baleen whale, is they're gonna dive down, they're gonna open their mouth, and you can see these lines here. These are grooves in their throat. And those grooves will expand, kind of like a balloon expands, and they can pull in more water. So the more water they can pull in, the more food they're gonna get, because their food is really tiny. They eat things like krill, which are tiny little shrimp, or bait fish, which are just small fish, and there's lots and lots of krill and bait fish in the water. So the more water they can pull into their body or into their throat, the more food they're gonna get. And then once they pull in all that water, they contract, they push together those throat grooves and it pushes the water out of their mouth 
and the water will travel through those baleen plates just like the water falls out of that container when you're straining your pasta and then all the food just like the pasta gets stuck on their baleen and then they have a very big tongue and they lick it all and so this is a group of whales baleen whales are filter feeders they're filtering out the water just like you filter your pasta out of the water they are filtering food out of the water to feed so here is a gray whale. This is another type of whale we see here along our coast. And you can see their baleen as well, right here. Now this whale also has a little piece of kelp stuck in its mouth, which happens from time to time. And when it goes in the water, it'll just kind of float away. But you can see those baleen plates. Now those baleen plates are only found on the top part of their jaw, so not on the bottom. So it almost kind of looks like a mustache in their mouth. And the scientific name for a baleen whale is mysticeti. Now a scientific word for a tooth whale is odontoceti. So think about like orthodontist, you go to get your teeth fixed. So odontoceti are tooth whales, but mysticeti are baleen whales. And mysticeti, it basically means mustache whale because they thought it kind of looked like a mustache when they were naming it. So it's their little mustache inside their jaw, only on the top. And those plates are stacked one after the other. So they're different plates individual, but a whale could have one to 200 plates just on one half and then another one to 200 plates on the other side, just depending on the type of whale. And the length of the baleen will also range depending on the type of whale. So this gray whale here, their baleen is only about 16, can be only about 16 inches long, not very long. I actually have a smaller piece of gray whale baleen. I'll put it on my document camera. So this is what that baleen looks like. So this is one plate. So if this was in the mouth, there'd be another plate stacked here, and another one here, and here, and here, and here, all the way around. And this is gonna be the outside, so what we were just looking at, and then the inside is this kind of brush bristly stuff, and that's what's used to catch all those pieces of food. Now, gray whales have a really interesting story. We do see them here. We see humpbacks here along our coast. We see blue whales, we see fin whales, but gray whales have a really interesting story because they're coming down to our coast for a different reason than we see most of the other whales. So for whales like humpback whales and for blue whales, we see them along our coast because they're here to feed, which is fine because this gray whale is actually feeding right here, but I'll explain in a moment. So gray, uh, humpback whales and blue whales, fin whales live here year round, but the other whales, they migrate from warmer waters where they breed to feeding waters here along our coast. So they're here only for food, which means if our waters warm up and there's not a lot of food, we may not see them. Or if our waters get really cold and there's lots of food, we'll see lots of whales. But gray whales, we'll see regardless of what our waters are doing because they are on a long migration. They have one of the longest migrations of any mammal in the whole world. They will travel round trip about 12 to 14,000 miles from Alaska, which is where they live in the summer because in the summer there's a lot of sunlight, which means there's a lot of food for them to eat because the sun helps all their food grow. So there's a lot of sunlight. And then when it gets to be October, so around now, the, there's a lot less sunlight, which means there's a lot less food. And that's sort of like a signal to the gray whales that they need to start making their way down the coast from Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, all the way down to Mexico, where their waters are nice and calm and really warm. And that's where they breed and they give birth to their pup or to their calves, pups for sea lions or seals, calves for whales. And then they'll make their way back up to Alaska. So whether our water is warm or cold, if they're looking for food or not, they are making this migration because they know they need to get down to those warm waters for their breeding and their birthing grounds and then making their way back up. Now that video we saw that Soraya put up where that whale was feeding, if we can go back to that video, this one right here. Now this is actually unusual for us to see a gray whale feeding on their migration. So most of the time when gray whales are making that migration, they're spending all their summer eating and getting really fat, which is a good thing for these whales, putting on a lot of weight, because that's going to give them energy as they're making their way down the coast. And they don't really stop to eat because they have one goal to get down there. And then when they go back up north, same thing. They have one goal to get back where they're going. But the last couple of years, we here at the aquarium have actually documented gray whales feeding. And this is something that scientists hadn't really seen before, which is kind of cool that we got to see this sort of groundbreaking thing these whales are doing. So what was happening is every so often a gray whale would actually come into our harbor. So if you've ever been down to the Long Beach area, we have where the aquarium is and then there's a harbor, which means it's protected. So there's water, it's the ocean, but once you go a little farther, there's a big rock wall. And that rock wall provides protection for our buildings that are here on land because if there's big waves, we don't want them hitting our buildings. So that rock wall protects it. And there's entrances and exits from that rock wall. 
And these gray whales, they found their way inside those walls into our harbor, and they're feeding, which you can see them doing right here. Now, they feed on mud. There's lots of little bugs in the mud, and that's what they're feeding on, which is why it looks like it's lots of muddy water there. But that's what this gray whale is doing. It's feeding. All right, we are about out of time. Like I said, I could talk for the next probably two hours or longer about marine mammals. But I did see we have one more question. The question is, is baleen hard or soft? That's a great question. Think about your fingernails. Are they hard or soft? They're kind of hard, but maybe a little bit flexible or bendable. And that's what baleen is. So this piece that I have here, I'll bring it in front of the camera. This one is dry, so it's pretty hard, but these bristles feel kind of like a straw broom. If you've ever seen a broom and it's got those bristles on it, that's kind of what it feels like. So it's a little bit flexible, but it is a hard structure because if it was really soft, imagine if they tried to filter all that water through, it would just kind of wiggle with the water. So it's got to have some structure to it so that it holds its shape, pushes the water out, and catches all that food. Excellent question. All right, everyone. So we are out of time, but if you are tuned in late and you have questions or you're still thinking about questions, go ahead and uh, you can text us. We'll be around for about the next hour or so, or you can uh, send us an email live at lbaop.org. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed learning about marine mammals, about seals and sea lions, the difference between the two, about some whales, and what makes a mammal a mammal. I hope you enjoyed, and tune in at 10 o'clock. We have a program in Spanish where we're going to learn all about different ocean habitats. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you later.